We are back. Welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm Rob Kavaroski, and as always, the yang to my yin, Susan Hobson. Here, Susan, how are you? I am so excited for today's podcast. Tell our people why I'm so excited for our podcast today. Well, I mean, we're going to be talking a little bit about the leadership journey that I've been on. And as you know, we're, well, for full disclosure, it's about a month away from the TED Talk. But as you listen to this, there'll be a few other times, but the recording of the TED Talk will be July 2nd. So right in the middle of prep mode and getting everything rolling. So it's an exciting time. It is a very, very exciting time. And it, there's so much behind what this represents. We just had to do a solo riff so we could bring our people behind the curtains, right? And really help them embody the excitement that we're feeling over here on this side of the fence, right? Because this has been a long time coming, this stage for you, hasn't it? Yeah. And I mean, before we go there, I got a quote from oh, Dwayne The Rock Of course Johnson. you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, The Rock making an appearance today. The man himself. Um, and he says, think back five years ago. Think of where you're at today. Think ahead five years and what you want to accomplish. Be unstoppable. Tell us why you picked that one, sir. Well, I mean, for folks who, who know that I've been on the journey, for me, five years ago, this wasn't even a, an imagination in my mind. And it's been such a shift, even, I mean, we've been working together just about four years now. And, you know, like you know, when I walked in the door, there was no emotional awareness. There was no um, thought about leadership at all. I actually had a negative connotation for what leadership was. I just remember that. Yeah. Um, I remember that. I had, a, like, my mindset was completely, I mean, I was in the, I was really in a bad place. And then, right, and then I was battling all these conditions and the beliefs that I had around just who I needed to be to get my needs met and how that wasn't happening and then the subsequent, you know, depression and, and suicide attempts that I had over the, like, basically last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a, quite the battle. But the, the goal or the point of all of this, right, is like, if you lean into the work and you, as The Rock says, be unstoppable, you can drastically change your life in an incredibly short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when you first walked through my door, what the motive was? Like, what was the driver at that stage of your growth game? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was pretty simple. Like, I had one of the biggest podcasts in the maintenance and reliability space, and I hated corporate. <laughs> um, and basically, my ask was, what can I do as fast as possible to turn that into a business so then I could get out of corporate? So the whole motive really in a nutshell was? Was, yeah, yeah like it was business consulting, make money, get out of, get out of the toxic leadership space. That's, that's what I remember, yeah. right? Like you would do almost anything to get out of that toxicity wasn't mm -hmm. just about leaving corporate and starting your business. It was about the freedom, right? That that represented the emancipation from the suffering that you were experiencing in that 1.0 led condition. Totally. And it's like, as I do the work and understand like the toxic bosses that are out there, right? Is like, we have this impression that a toxic boss is like Gordon Ramsay, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, like you're a donkey and like you don't understand and like this is garbage. You should be ashamed of yourself. And that's totally a type of bad boss. Like there is mm -hmm. no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're roughly like the only about 5.5% of the workforce actually experiences that. 
Yeah, they're the minority. Yeah, and it's like what often I had was not bosses that were completely out to get me, although I had a passive-aggressive boss and all that stuff, but it was like often it was bosses that were messy or or cowardly is technically both of the terms that we use, but they're like ghost managers, right? They're unwilling to make decisions. They're unwilling to accept accountability. They don't set, set expectations or dates or instructions, and it's just sort of like, go ahead and run. And then it's like, well, the outcome was not what I wanted, so you're you're not good, uh-huh. right? And I think that's the big piece that I start to see now is like, not only to mention the mindset that was going along with these leaders, uh-huh. but it just becomes clear as like, what type of boss they were, the mindset that they had, and then why that was so impactful on me as, as someone who was experiencing that type of leadership. And what is the impact that we experience when we have that type of leadership? Because a lot of people that hear these stats, right, or even the people who listen to your speech, you know, they don't maybe necessarily understand, like, how can that be so painful to have a boss that just isn't managing your expectations properly, right? Or whatever the case may be. What is it that's so painful about that? From a mental health perspective, what is that impact? Yeah, and that's the that's the difference, right? Is it depends on your conditioning and your beliefs about yourself, right? And so obviously if you listen to the pod before, you know that Susan and I are are kind of high achiever folks, right? We started off, you know, we played sports at a high level, we went to great colleges, we we graduated, right? And it's mm-hmm. like if you have that high achiever mindset, your recognition and validation and putting stats on the board is supposed to mean something about you. Mm -hmm. And so I always was raised with this idea of like, I am reliable, Rob, I'm the guy who delivers. And like all my coaches used to say this, like, Hey, you want someone to do something that sucks? Rob will do it. He'll just run through a wall and he'll do everything to win the game because that's who he is. So your reputation was around self-sacrifice. Interesting to note, right? Like well, that was, was literally like, what I you deliver. were known for. I know, but you were known yeah. for delivering no matter what you were experiencing, no matter what you were feeling, which is really significant. Yeah. This is this is significant for a lot of high achievers out there, right? It's like they they're known for taking the licking and keeping on ticking. <laughs> but that's the problem here, right? It's like you won't oftentimes see the level of suffering that this, that that that's actually causing a high achiever, because the high achiever is so good at compartmentalizing that pain mm-hmm. in the pursuit of that pleasure, right? Which is being reliable, Rob, the guy who will do what everybody else does not want to do. Yeah, but that's that's suffering, man. When we actually show up on the daily in that level of self-sacrifice, I think that's really important. And it's an important aspect of your story, isn't it? Yeah. And I mean, basically, it was, I had the expectation that had been hammered into me since I was a child, was like, when you deliver, someone's going to say, hey, you did a great job. Mm-hmm. Right, like this is, and they're going to validate your existence as a person mm-hmm. through, you know, you post stats, you win a game, you get an A. Like these things are all going to be like, hey, you did well. Mm-hmm. And then that was basically the the thing that caused me, like, you know, ten years or so of depression mm-hmm. was, like, in my first job, I posted the most savings out of any engineer in the company. And like my boss didn't want to disrupt status quo. And I mean, so looking back at it now, right, he was passive aggressive. And then also he would have done anything for his boss to like him. Uh And so the stuff that I was doing was new and different and innovative. And then it was like, I cannot allow my boss to see this because it meant that I am not doing the perfect job now. Right. And so he was changing my work. He was, you know, pushing the narrative up the, the chain that like everything was perfect and blah, blah, blah. And like this impacted me going like, 
if you don't want my work, you don't want me. Mm -hmm. And then who am I if I'm not wanted? Mm -hmm. And so there in lies both the problem and the solution, right? The pain and the opportunity. And do you remember the opportunity that you found in that pocket of your experience once you actually started to lead yourself in the direction of doing that work? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right? It, it's it's the mission now, right? Is And like literally in Australia after I did my keynote, someone came up to me and said, like, how do you feel about all that suffering that you went through? And I had that moment and I was like, you know, I'm actually thankful I went through it. Because it's not only just the, what came out the other side, but I learned so much through the darkness and then through emerging from it. And like we talk about this, Susan, but it's, it's we can only help people as far as we've gone. And if we've gone to the bottom, we can help folks who are at the bottom. You remember when that first opened up for you in the form of a visualization? You remember I had you starting to do visualizations. At first, you were like <laughs> hating me for it. I know that was a super painful experience because when somebody is in such levels and such depths of maladaptive coping, one of the biggest ways that we maladaptively cope with that level of pain and suffering is disassociation, right? And that disassociation made it so hard for you to be able to see anything in the future, right? So as we were starting to try to play the tape forward so we could entertain where we might want to take you, where, where, where it came to freedom and emancipation, like what was this all leading in the direction of? I remember you'd get so frustrated because you had such a hard time seeing that. But then one day you were able to penetrate the future and you were able to see what all of that suffering and that pain experientially in you was for as it pertained to others, right? In service to others. Do you remember what Yes, sir. Yeah, and I mean, before we go there, right, it's now I having the knowledge that I have. And if we talk in IFS language is the protectors prevent you from seeing the future. Because for me, I had my biggest, I guess, core belief was I'm not accepted or I don't accept myself. And mm -hmm. this came from my dad and all the other stuff, right? But that's sort of separate. And so if they allow you to see the future and things you could become and what you could do, they already have a belief baked in that you're never going to get there. And so they want to prevent your pain of being rejected by disallowing you to see that, right? And the other side is in the state I was in, I was very much in firefighting mode, right? And the one who was controlling the bus was, you know, the depressed, the shame part, the, like this stuff. And they cause, like I used to say, every day was a war. I was in, I was in a battle every day. I remember. And these parts, they're not allowing you access to anything other than putting one foot in front of the other. And so just wanted to give that context for folks. Like as you obviously, hopefully you're not in that state, right? But even if you experience resistance, there's some work you can do with your protectors to allow them to step aside so you can start to see what you want and play with that vision of the future for you. And if you're in a good state and you're just like experiencing some fear or some stress or some anxiety as you do these, you know, one is you can reach out to me, but it's like not, an, not a crazy exercise to do. It'll take five, 10 minutes and like it'll unlock a bunch of stuff where you can start to play with what that will be. 
So I wanted to get cue, that. <laughs> cue the rain. <laughs> so maybe we'll try this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, what I started to see as these things unlocked was I saw two things. One was living on a beach and two was doing a speech. Mm-hmm. And that was it. Like there was not much detail. It was remember. Not much else than that. <laughs> just a peek. Right? Like you just got a little peek into that future outcome. Yeah, I think that was at first. And then as we continued to do that work and we continued to heal, then it started to really open up for you. And I remember you actually seeing yourself on a stage and seeing yourself like affecting the lives of the people in the audience, right? And seeing people like you in the audience. And do you remember that when you were first able to? to experience what that felt like to be there. And I think you even had somebody from the audience come up to you and say, Rob, you saved my life. Thank you so much for your words of inspiration, right? Like, I I think I remember that, that even being a part of that visualization, right? Yeah, it was. And I didn't really, I mean, obviously you never understand it, (laughs) but it's, it's, Actually, there is some wisdom that you can start tapping into about greater than what we logically mean. And obviously, as we played with visualization, it started to come out. And as you start to open up these spaces, it will continue growing. And then, obviously, ketamine kicked the door down on all of that. Um, because it really, I mean, one of the benefits of ketamine is it allows your protector parts to go offline. And so it's known for allowing the protectors to step aside. And this allows you to either access exiles, which are your hurt child parts, in a safe way where you can give them the experiences and the, the parenting they need to heal. Mm-hmm. But also it allows you to access the future and your guides and your future selves and all that wisdom because your protectors are no longer thinking, oh, well, you're not good enough. Or, you don't belong. Or, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't think too big. You know, like all those that nonsense that we do. The uh, interference on the play. Yeah. It silences all of the critics and the doubters and the, all of that internal resistance in the self, right? So you saw yourself on a stage, you saw yourself changing people's lives. I think that's when it actually became crystallized that that's where you wanted to go next, right? Like that was going to be the next evolution of you. Flash forward uh, a couple of years later, you start working with your TED coach, right? And, And going for the TED stage. And here we are now. You have it in just a couple of weeks. So one has to ask i'm so curious like now that you're just a couple of weeks out from actually being on that stage and manifesting that experience that you visualized that gave meaning to all this useless suffering right that you'd experience because that's the thing that i love so much about the story buddy it's like the same thing that awakened your sense of purpose was the same thing that awakened mine. And that's why we're together on this journey right now, trying to change the way this game's being played forever through this 2.0 heart centric leadership thing is because, yeah, we don't believe that suffering should be useless. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's the big part, right. Is a lot of folks, and this is the part that is true is a lot of folks I mean, there's 65% of bosses are, are destructive or bad bosses, right? And these increase heart attack and stroke. And actually, the longer you work for those bosses, the more at risk you become of cardiovascular disease. Um, and also, it increases mental health risk, like burnout, anxiety, depression. These things are all tied in with bad bosses. Not to mention the fact that like performance goes down and like people, uh, profitability goes down and all these things happen as well, right? Mm-hmm. 
But ultimately, it's folks go and they suffer in these jobs that they don't understand what's the meaning, what's the point of all of it. And the advice that's out there about what do you do with a bad boss is frankly terrible. It's sort of like, hey, either suck up to your boss, make them yeah. feel good, which yeah. is basically like, imagine you're in an abusive relationship with your partner and you go to a therapist and they say, well, you know what? It's it's not their fault that they're abusing you. It's your fault and you better suck up to them so then they don't do this anymore, right? Like, obviously, that's not great advice. And then the other side is just like, hey, quit your job immediately. And that can also be not a great decision, right? Like what happens if I have to pay my rent? I don't have money in the bank. I'm on medical insurance that I need because I'm doing treatment or my children are doing treatment. Like these are things that also need to be considered. Otherwise, you know, you could you could quit your job. I mean, it's like, oh, no, I'm, like I, I can't pay my rent, can't feed my family, I can't do these things, right? And so there is nuance, obviously, in the discussion. And there's also nuance about each boss type. But ultimately, it's, and this is something that's the most important in what we teach, right, is awareness and ability for folks to make positive decisions for themselves. And so Carl Jung has a great quote, which is, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. And so in that moment of you suffering from a bad boss, it's you can make the choice to become who you want to be. And that doesn't have to be somebody who still works at that company or works for that boss or anything. You can choose, like I did, to do like I'm living in Costa Rica, it's raining, it's it's rainy season, as you can hear, right? And then I'm doing a TED talk. And it's like none of this was possible for me even a year ago, no matter, you know, no matter five years ago. And what made it possible now? The work. Right. No. And this no. is what folks don't all don't all see, right, is, you know, we work together, I don't know, something like 50 to 100 sessions, right? We were doing twice a week for a while. Um, I did the same thing with my therapist when I got her. I probably have done, I don't know, 200 sessions with her. I was doing two to three times a week with her for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, and then I found my psychiatrist and got on meds and then since then, I've done probably around 40 sessions at Ketamine, everyone from just in his office to the Dick Schwartz, right? And so it's it's all that, and then it's the daily stuff, right? And so it's like, yes, you have professional help, but I'm doing, like today, I was just before this, I was doing some visualization work, and like some parts work, and it's like, this is the mental gym. <laughs> it's not just like, and I, and I, this is, you also know this, but I have a big uh, trigger from the word manifest. Oh, right? yes. And it's like, I always thought that book, whatever, I forget what it is, but it's like the, the secret Lots or of something. The attraction or the secret, yeah. Yeah, and I always had this association where it's like, oh yeah, if I just believe it, like a Ferrari will fall from the sky <laughs> onto my driveway and like, I'll be good, right? And it's like, that is obviously not true. Like, like we're saying that, right? But it's like what Carl Jung says, which is like, I choose to be calm. When you start to see that, the stage, the beach, the these things, that's what you can choose. And that's what, you know, I went to therapy and then I hired a TED coach, which I never would have done. And then it was like, you're putting the work and the plan in place to get that. Yeah, and I think like most people don't understand. It's not like a, your wish is my command. Like that's not what we're talking about here. But what we're talking about here is we're talking about evolving, right? Like changing the way that you feel on the daily because so much of how you feel in the daily 
comes from your conditioning, comes from your your blueprint of beliefs. And that is from pre-10 years old. So when we're talking about choosing to become uh, that which actually meets the vibration of that which you're trying to call in, that's what manifesting is all about. It's about changing your beliefs, the things that actually create the neurochemistry, the feelings that govern the decisions that make things possible. Absolutely. Right. And like, let's look at the TED talk as an example, right? If you suffer from imposter syndrome, or you believe you're not good enough, or you don't accept yourself, or you're afraid of being rejected, or you don't belong, you'll never apply. Right? You'll sit there and go, wow, it'd be cool if I did a TED talk. And then you'll you'll never apply because you always mm-hmm. think you'll be That's close. You'll pull up the application and then you'll find a re your brain will like find a reason where you can't do it right now. You'll do it later and then you'll yeah. never do it. Right. And and that's what they say. Like with podcasts, they're like, if you do eight episodes, you're good and you'll go forever. And then with books, right. It's like, if you write over like one or two chapters, you'll do it. But so many folks say, Hey, I want to write a book. They write like two pages and then it's like, ah, it's out. Right. Yeah. And so it is the daily actions, but it's, it's the mindset and the beliefs like, you know, that I can do this and I will do this. And that's where even the work we do, which is like visualization builds the belief that you've done it already, Mm -hmm. which then aligns your, that 95 to 97% of your subconscious towards like, I'm already, I'm already a TED speaker. I'm capable. I've done it already. So therefore I have the capacity. That's, that's half the battle right there. Right. And it's about having the right emotions that even allow you to step into the ring or allow you to step onto the field or allow you to pick up the fe- the pen or start typing on the, the keyboard. It's the beliefs that make that possible, right? Because it's the beliefs that unleash the feelings that allow you to move in the direction of the actions that are going to make that thing possible. And so that is the work. The work needs to be consistent. The work has definitely been consistent where you're concerned. (laughs) And that work has brought you right to the doorstep of this manifestation, right? Of this thing that you never believed was possible for you. And so what is it that you're feeling now as you prepare for this big moment? Like just bring our audience behind the curtains a little bit so that they can share in some of what that experiences like when you do the work and you're consistent and then you manifest the opportunity, the possibilities. What's that like? What does it feel like for you right now, three weeks out? It's exciting, right? And it's like, I mean, obviously there's a lot of work to do. So there's some elements of like trying to get everything finished, but it's exciting. And there's no doubt in my mind of the outcome. And so I think a lot of folks, they're worried about like, oh, what I'm going to step on stage, is it going to go well? Am I, you know, public, like the Jerry Seinfeld joke, right? Which I love, which is like public speaking is the number one um, fear in America and death is number two. So folks would rather be in the casket than on the podium. (laughs) It's true though, right? Like, I mean, it's true because of how painful that experience is for most people to step into the ring or onto the field without the beliefs. That is pain and suffering. So that's not you. You don't have any of that like internal resistance, right? You're not battling any of that, but it's mostly excitement for you. Yeah. And that's, I mean, what Tony said, you know, a few weeks ago, right? Is like, once you access self, I mean, there's the eight C's of self that Dick talked about you know, but it's, there's no defense. And so you're just able to grow wherever you want. Right. And it's like, I am going to step on the stage and I have a hundred percent conviction that I'm going to deliver because one, that's who I am, but also it's just like, you have the confidence, the clarity, the courage, all the eight C's and you're just, it's just 15 minutes. (laughs) Like it's, you know, it's going to be, and folks will take it and they'll leave it. 
but to be honest, it's a it's a an incredible work of art what this talk is going to be. And so it's just an element of like, yeah, you just know. <laughs> yeah, because you have that level of self-trust when you're coming from the capital S self, right? Yeah. I think that's the biggest, biggest thing. The biggest prize at the end of that rainbow, I feel like, is the level of self-trust that you have, that you gain, that leads to the expansion do yeah. you agree with that? Absolutely. I've never really I mean, thought about it until this moment, like when we're talking about it in this way, in this thread. But that's really what that is. Like all of that work, right, on the inside is getting you to that that level of self-trust that makes things so possible for you to just step into. Totally. And it's it's something where you're just so connected with yourself and the impact that I already see is going to happen. And it's sort of like, it's just inevitable. Right. And, you know, maybe I don't have, you know, I wasn't, maybe I wasn't conditioned with the not good enough or don't belong. But I mean, I had like my biggest trigger was self acceptance. Right. And it's like, it can be incredibly scary for folks who are battling with self acceptance to step on a stage and be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Right. And this doesn't even mean like, and like I will talk about depression and suicide, but it's like, it's not even about that. It could even be like, you know, we're going to make some crazy jokes about like Jean-Claude Van Damme, right? Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's something where it's, you know, it's out there for a talk, right? And it's, it's, it's vulnerable in a way, but it's sort of like, I know, I mean, I think it's funny. <laughs> and so it's like folks who are going to resonate with me will like that and other folks won't. But I'll tell you this much, it's not going to be your standard leadership talk. <laughs> What's your biggest hope in terms of what you want people to get out of this talk? It's, I mean, there's two things that we're really hoping for folks to get. One is self-awareness and the other is self-authorization and so the awareness is how is my boss affecting me and like what can i do to either minimize that impact or is it like this event where you know my boss is gordon ramsay and i can't coach him and so i'm out right but then what does that roadmap out look like? And then the other is the self-authorization. And this part is, is incredibly hard. And it took me a long time to get there. Right. And which I said, you know, like moving here wasn't possible for me until like a year ago. And it's because like, you wouldn't give yourself permission to some, our audience understands why that would have been impossible is that you wouldn't give yourself permission that's that right. was reckless. I remember like asking you questions about that and you were just convinced that was reckless, and irresponsible. Yeah. And this is like, I mean, this is the moment, right? Like I tried to commit suicide and I woke up the next morning and logically I knew my boss was killing me. My job was killing me. Right. And everyone says, Hey, you know, rock bottom, you, you'll have this magical transformation. Right. And it's not true. And the stats actually, a lot of suicide attempt survivors just continue their lives. And logically you go, well, that's insane. But it's their firefighter parts and their manager parts are so strong and so baked in that they're trying to hold on to this mask of my identity. And so they don't, they shut down the ability for you to choose. And so for me, I knew my job was killing me and I knew it was horrible and I knew all these things. And yet I was unable to quit because I had a belief like, who am I if I don't make money? Who am I if I don't have a job? And so it was like, you well, you got to apply for other jobs so then you can get another job and then you can get out, right? But then imagine you're going into a job interview and you're suicidal and they're right. like asking you these questions 
And then they're going to be like, yeah, you know, it doesn't feel good. Right. And that's actually statistically proven out. So Harvard Business Review talks about folks who work for a bad boss and they statistically are at the job two years longer than everybody else. And so this is the element is like, if you can get to the point where you can choose, you can choose the best path. That's what it's all about, right? Like we, where we started is where we're going to land this plane. It was really the motive that brought you through my door. The driver was freedom. Yeah. And so what do we have to say about freedom as we land this plane? Because this really is what this represents, right? That's what it is, right? It's really what it is. Yeah. As you do the work and you unburden your exiles and you gain trust with your protectors and even transfer roles. And so they don't say, you know, I have to be a people pleaser. I have to be, you know, um, overworker, high achiever, or all these things. When those go away, you're allowed access to self and self has the eight C's and the five P's. And these allow you to be like, hey, I want to do this, <laughs> right? And you're choosing from a place, not of fear, but from growth. And that's when things become possible that you would never imagine, right? And it's like, I never thought I would do a TED Talk and literally have access to, you know, at least probably 10, 20,000 folks, if not, like, you know, the potential is Brene Brown, Simon Sinek, right? And it's like, that was never even a thought in my mind. <laughs> and like, I never, didn't know leadership never... coaching was a job. I didn't know anything <laughs> about psychology. Like none of this stuff was even in my realm of possibility, even, you know, four years ago, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's like, you can choose to become that. That's really what this is all about today, right? Is like trying to inspire our folks to understand like why we come on this show every single week, trying to make a case for the work. It's because the work is what leads to the choice, right? Which leads to greater and greater levels of freedom right? And choice, but choice to go out into the world and do things that you feel called to do, right? Because there's some kind of significant meaning to that for you or purpose associated to to that. And I think like, in case we haven't noticed what's been happening in the world over the last couple of years, I kind of feel like that is some of what we've been trying to get on this show every single week since we started this show to make a case for right? It's like, we really, we need to be doing the work now more than ever, right? Because things need to change. I think we're all feeling that call, especially in the context of leadership. So good on you, Rob. The model carries the most weight. Here you are in the integrity of everything that we teach and everything we're so passionate about teaching because of what this work leads to which is the the possibility, right, for us all to have the freedom of choice, to get out into the world and play our biggest impact game in ways that matter, in ways that the world needs right now, and in ways that are going to lead us towards greater and greater levels of feeling what, sir? It's, right, and it's, that that's the piece, right, is this work isn't easy. And it's not an overnight thing, but you can go incredibly far in a relatively short amount of time, right? Like five years from now, you out there can be anything you want to be. You can be something you can't even imagine yet. That's the truth. Because I can say that because four years ago, I didn't, walking in your door, I didn't know a damn thing about leadership coaching or anything. Right. And it's it's going on that journey and starting small and discovering 
these elements of like, who am I? You know, what are my values? Well, who do I want to become? What does that look like for me? And allowing your hearts and your protectors to step aside so you can access the core wisdom that you have and, and the ability for you to choose from self. And that unlocks literally everything. You know, you can move to a country you've never been before and not feel stressed about it. You can go to a country I've also never been before and do a TED Talk in front of most people who don't speak English. And yet, <laughs> yeah, right. And yet, have a profound impact doing. It. Yeah, and ultimately, the feeling that you described is excitement, right? Like it's invigorating to become, to evolve, to realize more and more of your capacity. Like that's the thing we don't talk about enough on this show. That's where I wanted to land this plane for our people to understand, like, that's what keeps us doing the work. Right? And the growth is always there, right? And you've seen it, Susan, like in the last two months or so, my coaching has gone to another level. Mm -hmm. And part of this is, right, is like, one is incorporating the work, but it was also moving here, allowed me access to things that I had lost in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for folks out there, like if you have a bad boss or you work at a bad company and like all these things, one is to do the self work and allow yourself to choose to put yourself in a better environment. Right. Obviously, this has the caveat, right? Keep all the other stuff in consideration. But once you allow yourself to choose one thing, it becomes easier. Right. And then you can get bigger and different and start to build trust with your parts, which mm -hmm. leads to outcomes far beyond what we can imagine. Yes, I love it. I think this is where we, we want to land this episode for our people. Uh, do you have any final words of inspiration before you take this TED stage for our folks that have been so faithfully tuning in and following along on this journey with you? Thank you for the support. Right. And I'm sure the audience is going to get a lot bigger pretty soon. And, you know, each and every one of you who listens, you supported us from the beginning. Right. And, you know, right now, I think we're number three podcast in Canada. And we've been sharing some incredible content, some incredible thought leadership. And, you know, it wouldn't be possible without you. And then the other side is, I hope you found some inspiration to go on your journey. And, you know, whether you want to, you know, read a book or continue to listen to the show or start to dip your toes into any of the work or programs that we have, like totally get out there and, and connect with folks and, and start to dip your toe in because it's worth it. <laughs> That pain is your calling. It's calling you and awakening you to your untapped potential. So if this is you listening out there and you're resonating with some of Rob's story, we really hope that you'll answer this call. Reach out to us. Get in touch. Let us, let us sit and let us have a chat with you in terms of where you're at on your leadership journey. But ultimately... No matter where you're at on your journey, we know that you found something in this interview. Thanks for letting us put you on the hot spot today, on the hot seat, buddy. <laughs> I was just really looking forward to this. is kind of like a full circle moment for us. And I just want to say I'm so freaking proud of you. I'm so freaking proud of you because I've been the one that's been here day after day watching you answer that call. And I have to say, like, it's it's been really inspiring for me to ride shotgun. Oh, thank you. And... I mean, you're the catalyst for the work. So it was incredible that I found you through whatever higher higher power that was guiding. <laughs> we were definitely chosen to be teammates. That is for damn sure. Absolutely. And so folks out there, please hit subscribe to the Leadership Launchpad Project on your favorite podcast platform. Drop us a rating and review as well and then also share it with any leaders in your life and totally um when the ted talk comes out on youtube we'll be sharing it everywhere so follow us 
um, elite high performance on LinkedIn, Instagram. You can also follow me, Boss Coach Rob. I'm on TikTok and Instagram now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't a, forget to mention a, that. Yeah. As a Gen Z, no. Um, mm-hmm. But I put out some funny content out there. So if you if you love that stuff, uh, connect with me there. And then obviously for the leadership programs, one-on-one coaching, all that stuff, head on over to EliteHighPerformance.com. And if you want to get the how to deal with an asshole boss program, head on over to howtodealboss.com. So that's going to be fun. Um, <laughs> that's going to be fun and you're going to enjoy it. So totally stay tuned there. Susan, it's always a pleasure and thank you for your support on the journey. Oh my gosh, this has been such an honor and so much fun. I can hardly wait for the next chapter. What are we going to manifest next, buddy? <laughs> You dot, already know. Dot, dot. <laughs> I know, I know we know, but dot, 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 stay tuned to Absolutely. be continued. <laughs> Absolutely. we got some incredible stuff coming down the pipeline for all of you. Oh yeah. And we're just getting started. That's right. And we're taking our, our program and our coaching game to the next level as well. So mm-hmm. definitely stay tuned and reach out to us. Everyone, folks, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for joining us over the last I think we're at 125-ish episodes now. So it's been an incredible journey. And don't worry, we ain't stopping. (laughs) That's right. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.